evening, everybody. My name is Ellie Weisenberg Kelly, and I'm the manager of public programs here at the Pecanico Center. And I want to welcome you to our first public program of 2020, featuring the fabulous Machine Dazzle and Elisa Author. We're so happy to have you both here tonight. Um, before we begin tonight's program, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are on and the original peoples who populated it, the Lenape. We invite you to join us as we honor this land and the indigenous people who first inhabited it. And following tonight's discussion, we will open the floor to a Q&A. I'll have a mic and I'll come around to anyone who has questions. And then we invite you to join us in the auto hall for a reception. Machine Dazzle is our artist in residence this week. Machine has been dazzling stages via costumes, sets, and performance since his arrival in New York in 1994. In 2017, he was awarded the Bessie Award and the Henry Hughes Design Award by the American Theatre Wing for his design and conception of the costumes for Taylor Mac's A 24-Decade History of Popular Music. His original show, Treasure, premiered last September at Works in Process at the Guggenheim. And in 2020, he will unveil a piece for The Big Splash, commissioned by Hancher Auditorium, in collaboration with the Municipality of Iowa City and the University of Iowa. He's an artist in residence at Mana Contemporary in Jersey City, New Jersey, and has held residencies at Wesleyan University and Harvard University, among others. Elisa Author is the Deputy Director of Curatorial Affairs and Chief Curator at the Museum of Arts and Design. Her most, most recent curatorial exhibitions for the Museum of Arts and Design include Surface Depth, the Decorative after Miriam Shapiro, and Vera Paints a Scarf, the Art and Design of Vera Newman. And now here to tell you more about our artist residency program is Ben Rodriguez Cubeñas, program director for the Culpeper Arts and Culture Program at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Uh, thank you, Ellie. Ellie has been with us, uh, with us for eight months, and she's been a great collaborator, so thank you. And thank you, Machine and Lisa, for sharing your story and being with us this evening. Um, so on behalf of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, welcome everyone. The uh, Rockefeller Brothers Fund provides time and space and support for artists uh, to, uh, for their creative process. We also have a lot of partnerships, and one of the partnerships is with uh, Guggenheim Works in Process. We have Caroline Cronson and Duke Dank from Works in Process with us here this evening, so thank you for coming. And it's a way also, uh, these, these panel discussions, these opportunities to present the work of our artists also presents the opportunity to showcase our grantees. So thank you. We have a, uh, an amazing season coming up. We've got American Ballet Theater. We have Abraham in Motion. We have Carnegie Hall Ensemble Connect. We have Dance Lab New York. Um, and many others that we're still planning. So we hope that you come back and tell your friends, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, Machine, it's great to be here with you, and I want to thank the audience for joining us. We're most grateful and looking forward to this conversation. Uh, let's get started. Full disclosure, uh, Machine and I are working on an exhibition that will open at the Museum of Arts and Design next year in March of 2021. So consequently, we've been spending a lot of time together conceptualizing the exhibition. And a big part of that involves combing through <coughs> Machine's archive, which consists of huge cardboard boxes of material. So <laughs> we've had a good time. And that's the kind of initial work um, for any exhibition. Uh, it's a fascinating process of discovery. Um, but it's also one that's private and that often takes place just between a curator and artist, usually in a home or a studio. And thus, it's off view to the public. So with that in mind, tonight, um, I thought I would design our conversation to make the process a little more public. And so, Machine, instead of peppering you with all the conventional questions about your background and influences, I'm going to surprise you with a group of objects that I photographed um, that I've pulled from your archive. Some of these we've discussed. There's others that I don't think you saw, and then I'm still confused about, like, what is this, and how does it fit into your story? So you're, you're going to be on the spot, but I know you're, a great, you're, you're great in front of an audience, so I'm excited to hear what you're going to have to say. I will and, persevere. Yeah. And I hope, I hope that the objects that I've pulled together, because there's a lot of material, and this is just a small little um, uh, taste of it, it's going to basically guide the conversation more organically about like who you are as an artist, what your story is, um, what, like all the different performance contexts you've worked in, 
what you're doing now, where you're going. So that's, that's the objective. So let's see, let me go forward here. I'm going to start with just setting the scene. This is your oh. apartment. You don't know that I took this photo. Um, I didn't know. <laughs> but there it is. And here we are on the couch over here. And oh. I'm looking out, and I remember uh, the, the title of the exhibition is Queer Maximalism, Machine Dazzle. Um, so I thought to myself, so when did you discover you were a maximalist machine? Because your, your apartment <laughs> clearly is related to your overall aesthetic. Uh, um. I think I discovered that I am a maximalist when I started being called a maximalist. Uh, just because of the nature of what I do, I guess I'm always, uh, I am a more is more person. <laughs> I'm a more is more artist. Um, and uh, I, I'm always taking things further. I think further is probably one of my favorite words. And I, um, you know, building, okay, you get so far, but I'm never really satisfied. I'm like, but it's kind of like, um, you know, when you get a new toy and then you're like, you know, you're bored with it After in a very short amount of time. I was definitely that child. And uh, so I was like, wait, wait, more, more. But then they come together. So, you know, right. yeah, people call me a maximalist. That's how I know that I am one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is just setting the stage. Um, here's another thing I found. This was probably produced in 97, and it's a resume. Probably the kind of thing you would expect to find and maybe not so exciting to look at, but it's very revealing, I think, of your origin story as an artist. And I'm specifically um, interested in this period here where you did all of these uh, right. performances for Exit Art, which, as far as I know, these are the earliest examples, right? Uh, that would be the earliest. Yeah. And do you want to talk a little bit about Exit Art and those, like what you were doing there? Or sure. Is this is sort of a debut for you. Sure. Um, Exit Art. How many people n remember Exit Art in New York? Okay, great. So you know. Um, it I moved. was one of the more um, experimental. I mean, it lasted for thirty years. Well, it it was it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it was founded by Papa Colo and Jeanette Ingraman. Jeanette's no longer with us. Um, I moved to New York in 1994, and I got like a job at a tea salon. And um, but uh, I had heard about these really amazing openings and all of this really cool art, you know, interesting art, you know, really amazing openings and all of this really cool art, you know, interesting art, you know, going on at this place. And I ended up going to an, an opening. I met one of the artists and I'm like, wow, this place is cool. And um, I went in and I asked if they wanted volunteers because I just wanted to work. I'm like, let me do it. You know, I had this, you know, day job and then I would, you know, volunteer there a couple, you know, days a week. And then um, they ended up hiring me, <laughs> so, and that was exciting. And then, um, and then I became I became one of the performers. Not only did I work there, but something that was unique about Exit Artists, it was very kind of tight. It was a family, um, very conceptual, and uh, I, I started performing. I started experimenting with performance art. I, uh, you know, in performance art. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of different mediums and puts it into one and, I don't know, you're making stories, you're making images, you know, with your body, with your voice, however, you know, in front of people. It's a live uh, situation and I didn't, had never studied performance art before I started making it. It just seemed like what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, and then I also had like drawings, you know, that I exhibited and um, it was one I remember once when I, um, I pulled all these drawings out of my portfolio and they were laid out all over the floor and um, I was talking with um, Papa Colo and he's like, well, you know, this is before I was a machine. Back then I was just Matthew. And, <laughs> and uh, he's like, well, Matthew, these are, these are beautiful. These are beautiful. Um, but, you know, what do you, what's going on here? I want to know, like, do you have, you know, do you have the cure for AIDS in your work? Why am I looking at this? And, uh, you know, I was 21, and I'm like, you know, that's like a very valuable experience. That's a very valuable thing that he said to me at an early time in my career. And, and from then on, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. Why should I just like make something unless it's, it's uh, talking uh, to a conversation that needs to happen? 
uh, that kind of thing. And so these days I, I tend to, I'm only inspired to make art um, out of necessity, I think. I don't make beautiful things, I make necessary things. This is related. Um, this is one of oh, the right. shows. Right. Tara Bomba. Yes. I, you're still listed there as Matthew Flower, but I think yeah. this is a performance, <laughs> right? Yeah, that Tara Bomba. That was performance. Wait, or is, we have to remember like which one this is. Um, <laughs> Tara Bomba. I think this is when. Um, so there was an exhibit inside of Exit Art, and um, there were all of these. It was very installation based. It was an installation based exhibit, and um, so and they selected performance artists to choose an installation that is not theirs. Um, and you know, create the performance in it, around it, incorporating it, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And someone had built a shower, and so, and so this is, and I, I don't know, I kind of made a bit of a mess, I admit, but I, I, I um, anyway, that's what I did. I, we could talk all night about that I performance. Mean, thanks for <laughs> that shower because there's a bunch of photographs in one box that we did not look at, but they're all of that performance. I just made that connection in my head. Body, so I was all doing colors. Done too while we're, yeah. We're here. Yeah. yeah, 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 awesome. yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, so there's a lot of different performance contexts, though, that you're working in. Like exit art is like you know experimental um, ICA, let's say, right? But I think there's also there's drag, there's the downtown club scene, and this appears, um, these two snapshots, and I'm assuming they go together because it's the same costume. That's the same night. Um, so I was very young, and um, I was so much thinner. And um, yeah, this is like early drag. Um, I started experimenting with drag when I first moved to New York. I didn't do it beforehand. And um, uh, this was just, I don't know, I was interested in drag and it, it hadn't really, I mean, there was this kind of explosion of drag, you know, in the 80s into the 90s and then it kind of like died back down and now we are in a very huge drag moment that has happened, uh, you know, like RuPaul's Drag Race and it seems like it's everywhere, almost like burlesque. Burlesque is everywhere, drag is everywhere. It's, it's kind of exciting. I don't know how long it'll last, you know. Um, I was... I've always been interested in, um, oh, I don't know, dressing like somebody else. It's less about drag, and this is unusual because this is something that I got rid of a long time ago in terms of like, um, you know, breasts. <laughs> and it's like, you know, this is before like foam, queens weren't doing foam. And, um, uh, I decided at some point uh, that I just wanted to wear kind of, I guess, outrageous costumes just on my own body. This is when I was still like figuring out like what makeup is, what is drag, I'm like, how do I wear, you know, high heels, because I didn't always wear them. Um, now I'm a pro and people wonder how I wear these things and now I'm just like, well, it's, yeah, it's practice. Um, does this coincide with exit art or this This, this is, does this not go, this has nothing to do with exit art. Um, this is just me at a party. I had a friend who um, had this rather big chateau in the south of France and he invited me there for a big birthday and he had his own miniature theater. This is his own miniature theater. I lost touch with these people a long time ago. His name is Jean. <laughs> and, uh, and that was me experimenting with both drag and burlesque because I did like the classic balloon dance where I popped all of them. Hmm. Balloons, and you know, I think I even experimented singing like an a cappella song, uh, you know, because I've always wanted to do music, um, which I'm doing now, but I was like, I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know how to sing back then. Hmm. I, I take voice now. Hmm. It's <laughs> God. Okay. Oh. Forward. So these <gasps> oh. these look a little more experimental. Like if you want to make it, I, I assume you're making you're distinguishing like this early drag entry into the scene. See, this is yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. Um, this is more. Well, this is definitely more developed. Maybe you've noticed a difference between that early drag photo and then this. <laughs> um, this is like um, I don't know breaking down walls like everything is everything, more is more. It's like, why do I need to be confined to this like one like kind of like, I don't know, drag persona? I don't like those two words, but I can't think of anything better to say right now. Um, I really just wanted to be something else. It was genderless, 
it was, uh, and still is, um, just something like colorful, something that has stories, uh, something, uh, something scu sculptural, big, bigger than life, like more, more, more. It's like, and I, you know, I stopped wearing wigs because I just like, wigs are so common. I don't like wigs, ew. Um, I like something else, I want something more interesting, something that takes the place of hair that is not a wig. Do you know what I mean? Because a wig is still understandable. There's no story. It's a wig, you know, it's, it's, it's a hair, it's, but, you know, but all of a sudden, what if you're making a wig out of straws that you find on the beach? You know what I mean? There's a story there, you know, straws are bad for the environment, but they sure make a great headpiece, and it's more interesting, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but these are different contexts too, like three different contexts, I would assume, where you're oh, experimenting with performance or using those definitely. contexts. Yeah, like this, this one on the top, left. That's me from Night of a Thousand Stevies. Now that's a theme party. Does anyone know what Night of a Thousand Stevies is? Okay. For those of you who don't know, it's a tribute, an annual tribute party to Stevie Nicks. And it's really fabulous. And it is 30 year anniversary this year. And I've been going to that party since 1995. And I've been performing at that party for about 12 years as one of the go-go dancers. And just let me tell you that being one of the go-go dancers is the best because you get more stage time than anybody. <laughs> because they have like three sets of music and then in between the three sets, there are two sets of like go-go. So I, I get up there and I can like dance around to Stevie Nicks in one outfit that I make and then, and then I get to have a costume change and then I can do it all over again. And I get paid and it's a great, I love traditions. As much as I like to break traditions and things, I actually love traditions in terms of like annual traditions. Like, oh, I just, well, I love going to Night of a Thousand Stevies. This one is from the Mermaid Parade. I love going to the Mermaid Parade. Has anyone here ever been to the Mermaid Parade? Mm -hmm. Or heard of it? Okay. Coney Island, um, although I've been, you know, I have friends who've been down on it oh, recently just because of misogyny and like, oh, there's a bunch of gross guys there like looking at the mermaids and they're, you know, I don't know, it was never like that for me. I speak from privilege. People just wanted to take my picture and I was happy with it. You know, they weren't looking at my exposed anything. Um, anyway, that's me. That's probably around 2005, maybe. Um, this is me, I think, I don't know. This is probably like 2007. Of course, this is now, this is actually um, another tradition that I love is Invasion of the Pines. Does anyone know what that is in this room? <laughs> it's, um, so there's this story, um, I think it was 1976. Okay, so Fire Island. There are two gay towns in Fire Island, Cherry Grove and the Pines. And back in seven, uh, 17, 1976, <laughs> sorry. I'm involved in this big show when we start in 1776. Later, and uh, uh, a drag queen from Cherry Grove went over to the Pines to a gay bar and wanted a drink. And the bartender was like, well, we don't really like your kind here. Why don't you go back to Cherry Grove where you belong? That's like gay on gay bashing. It's like, that's not cool. And so what happened is the next day was 4th of July and she came back with like 30 of her drag queen friends and then they invaded the pines and they were like, look, we're here, we're queer, we need to get along, we belong together, you know, that kind of like camaraderie. And so to this day, on the 4th of July every year, there is invasion of the pines. Although the queens aren't walking on the beach anymore, there is now, have, if you've been out to, you know, Cherry, uh, Fire Island, you know, they have those big, those boats, the ferries. So now it's a whole thing. You go, you get ready, there's a whole ferry, it costs money, you get on this ferry, there are hundreds of drag queens on this ferry, it leaves Cherry Grove, it goes over, it docks in, fire, uh, in the pines where thousands of people are waiting with their cameras, horns, confetti, screaming, parties, crazy things, and then there's a huge red carpet on the dock and every queen on the boat is announced as they get off. That's what it is these days. And that was me, and actually you can see, wait, was I still on the boat? I can't tell where I, no, that's me on the boat. 
I, I don't know, I can't write down. Anyway, um, that was one of my looks. And well, I know, maybe nothing new, like ship on the head, Marie Antoinette, but I think I give it a new twist. <laughs> anyway. I guess the other context would maybe be the Easter parade. Um, um, Easter parade, yeah, yeah, I like to go to the Easter parade. I do, um, I like taking my work to the streets, my person, my art. Um, so every time that something happens in public, it's kind of the perfect platform to say something. Um, and I've done a lot of this. Um, Easter parade, um, the very first time I went to the Easter parade, it was pretty modest. You know, I looked cute. And so this nice black dress and this like hat. And I was like, you know, it was tasteful. But then I realized something. I'm like, wow, I could really like do something here. I could turn, I, this could become performance art. And so that's what I started to do. And these days, there's always some kind of a message, and it's usually political. And um, I don't know. I do have some favorite outfits from, you know, my Easter's, my Easter's past. Mm. And uh, yeah. And then, of course, any march on Washington is a great opportunity to pull a good look. And um, I have some great looks from <laughs> the years of that. Yeah, yeah, it's called the Red, White, and Blue series. Although sometimes I call it Red, White, and Black. Just, I don't know, just, I like that color combination. We'll get to the red, white, and blue. I've got some okay. good images. Okay, you yeah. do. Oh. But I think before that, could we talk a little bit about the Dazzle Dancers? Because this is a group where you're doing costumes and performing as part of, oh wait, right. I forgot that I put this in here because this is another performance. Oh, we can talk about it. Yeah, this is, a, this is important because now you're, I mean, it's one of a number of um, uh, sort of artifacts from performances where you're doing the costumes. Right. This is a postcard from maybe 2004. Mm -hmm. um, this is Julie Atlas Muse. Who knows Julie Atlas Muse? Hardly, I see one, a two. She's amazing. Um, most people would know her as a burlesque artist, but she's really a performance artist. She takes burlesque to the next level, really. Um, the very first show that I ever costumed, show meaning performers in a theater, dialogue, like a show, was this one. This is called I Am the Moon and You Are the Man on Me. It was at PS122. And uh, I think that was her husband at the time. Um, behind her. Anyway, I did the costumes for the show. And um, I met Julie um, through, you know, my Dazzle Dancer years. Um, just, I, uh, the Dazzle Dancer is a, should I wait to talk about no, that until no, you, right do you have a thing? Yeah. Oh, look, well, here we are. Okay. Well, there's the machine. <laughs> so, just so you know, um, this is part of my, how I got my name, too. Um, it's two steps. Um, when I first moved to New York, you know, I started like, you know, doing, I was doing a lot of clubbing, dancing. People loved the way I danced, and they used to call me the dancing machine. But it wasn't until later, you know, a few years, you know, four or five years later, that people just started calling me machine. Because the dancing machine, of course, it became machine because nobody wants to say the dancing machine every time you show up. And uh, so I was, I was just machine amongst my group of friends. And then, in the year 2001, um, I became a Dazzle Dancer. The Dazzle Dancers had existed for a few years already, um, but they uh, were looking for more interesting costumes, and the one doing the costumes, his name is Gary, didn't want to do them anymore. Um, and so they asked me. And so originally, I would show up to like a Dazzle Dancer gig, and uh, I would put the dancers in these costumes, and I would be wearing kind of like this drag, more extreme version of what they were wearing. And I wasn't one of the dancers. But then it wasn't very long, you know, before I became one of the dancers, because, you know, you're out at a gig, and then someone doesn't show up, because there's no money. There's no money in Dazzle Dancing. <laughs> you know, if we got like $50 and a few drink tickets, you know, that's kind of like what the Dazzle Dancers, you know, we were part of the exotic milieu. Maybe you noticed that the costumes are kind of small and <laughs> removable and although kind of glamorous, you know, fairly disposable. Um, yeah, so there we are. <laughs> I think I, wait, uh, I got a group shot here too. Oh, there we are. Oh. 
This photograph is taken by Mr. Means. Do you want to talk about the D string? Because I think this is a particular. This is a classic D string. So um, what I would do is, you know, I, I'm not, I never took a sewing class in my life. I'm not a tailor. I've kind of made my way. In fact, there's nothing that I do today that I studied. Um, I didn't study music. I didn't study singing. <laughs> I didn't study um, fashion or theater or anything. I kind of learned that on my own. Um, when I went to school, it was, you know, fine arts, but it was, I didn't know who I was. I needed to move to New York to tell me who I was. I finally found myself. Anyway. Um, the D string. Oh, the D string. Um, so I would like show up. You know, I uh, always had like a full time job. And, um, you know, I didn't really have time to make costumes anyway, so I needed to find a way to just make things on the spot. So I could, I would show up, all I needed was a few yards of fabric and some scissors. That's all I really needed. And so I would show up and just the way that I cut everything, um, I call them D-strings for Tazzle, of course, and um, it's like this rectangle, there's a center slit and then like, ladder slices all along the way. And then you like put it on and you wrap it around and I would like actually just literally tie these things onto each dancer. Um, you know, sometimes there were six of us, sometimes there were 10 of us. Um, anyway. Because you oh. were gonna take it off anyways. <laughs> we were gonna take it off anyways. I forgot about the second part of Machine Dazzle. So I became part of the Dazzle Dancers. I was already Machine. Everybody had a Dazzle name. Um, so, like, there's Cherry Dazzle right in front, the blonde. There's Robbie Dazzle, Edible Dazzle, Vinny Dazzle, Besame Dazzle, Chunky Cupcake Dazzle, Dazzle Dazzle. That's Mike Albo. He originated the Dazzle Dancers. There's Machine Dazzle. Um, Pretty Boy Dazzle, Soshni Dazzle. I think Soshni means juicy in Russian. And that's, um, is that Viva Propesh? Uh, no, Dazani. Zani Dazzle. Let's leave it at that. It's, it's a very long name. And so I was already machine, so I just became machine Dazzle. That's the real origin of the story. This might be a good point to talk name. about some of the other um, performance groups you were a part of, America mm. and also the um, Pixie Yes, Harlots. right. So the Dazzle Dancers, we were, you know, strong. We kind of had our heyday in about 2006. Um, but during that time, um, you know, we can talk about politics, you know, <laughs> you know, we can talk about George Bush getting elected and then getting re-elected and um, I became, uh, there was this uh, little movement called the Glamericans, the Glamorous Americans for Peace and uh, we would get all dolled up and we would go to, you know, like Washington, we would march on Washington Street, we would go on the buses, we would like be in the streets of New York for, you know, protesting the RNC. Um, and other things, and I would have little political fashion shows at like dive bars, uh, and uh, we were we had fun. We had fun, and then we got arrested. Um, in 2003, we got arrested, and um, mm. I know I have interesting a, that you bring this up because please explain. Oh. <laughs> right, that's me, kind of in track. I was dressed. I was dressed like a Texas oil cowgirl. Um, they didn't let me wear my. Um, uh, cowgirl hat in the picture. Um, but I did, I did, I had my boots on. Um, so yeah, we were arrested. We were protesting the Carlisle group. The reason is um, the Carlisle group was, uh, we had just waged war in Iraq and they were business as usual. And our chant was no war, no profits, no business as usual. Um, I was in drag, we were there early in the morning and the police, uh, we weren't doing anything wrong. We were protesting legally. Um, we weren't blocking sidewalks. We had video. And um, so, but the police decided to arrest everyone. If you were on the block, you got arrested. There were pedestrians who got arrested. There were photographers who got arrested. I was arrested. I was put in, uh, put in drag and or put in jail. And there was one other drag queen, Linda Simpson, who was with me, and um, I have to say that when you're arrested, be in drag, because they don't mix you with everybody else. They kind of, they put you, we were in the women's section of the jail, but in our own cell. Well, don't, you don't mix, you don't mix. You know what's crazy is, and I just remembered this, while we were sitting there, me and Linda, we had to like do everything together. And you know, it's real, there's no romance in jail. 
um, let alone prison, I mean, it's like bad food, bad lighting. It's like the DMV, like disgruntled workers <laughs> who don't even know how to fingerprint you properly. But the, the upside to this story is, um, well, while we were there, there were like, like these women and like young children like coming in. Like, and, we were, and Linda Simpson was like, hey, hey, why are you in here? <laughs> like, they were blocking an abortion clinic. <laughs> oh. I don't know, oh my God, I know, crazy, you never know. Um, but uh, well, the, the upside of that is um, um, we made a case and uh, we sued the city and, uh, because we had video evidence that we weren't doing anything wrong and um, everyone in my group, the Glamericans, 52 people, we got a settlement. settlement. We each got $18,000 and that was, um, that was like um, mildly historic. It's like, well, no, you can't just um, arrest people when they're not doing the wrong, when they're within their rights. We got a settlement because our First Amendment rights were taken away that day. You know? So that's it, the Glamericans. That's the Glamericans. Sorry, I ramble. I ramble. That's okay. It's, it's all very interesting. Yeah. Um, mm. Was that a short-lived group? Because Dazzle mm. Dancers is pretty short-lived. Short-lived group, just because you know politics come and go, and you know we got arrested, and that really put, it puts it. And there's a reason why they arrest you because they don't want you to do it. And I have to admit it, it did kind of put a damper on things. It's like, well, I don't have time to get arrested. I mean, I got arrested at 8 a.m. My coworker saw me on the news getting put into the paddy wagon. Hmm. And um, I called my boss, and he didn't pick up because it was too early. He's like, um, hi, Gerard, I'm sorry. I don't think I'm coming in today. I'll call you later. That's it. And then they took my phone away. Hmm. And no, they don't give you a phone call. No, they don't. <laughs> They don't want, they just, they want to make it difficult so that you just don't do these things. And it took, anyway, though. Do you want mm. to talk about the Pixie Harlots? <gasps> Pixie Harlots. Pixie Harlots is kind of a, it's, that's like after um, Dazzle Dancers kind of had their day. Um, it was a group of about six of us, and it was very, like, gender ambiguous, you know, drag, kind of cabaret um, performers. We would do numbers. Um, we were really popular with um, Earl Dax, um, Justin Vivian Bond. Um, we were very popular downtown during that time. Um, and I don't know, that was like just fun. Mm. It was like kind of, it wasn't just like taking off your clothes and, you know, working for drink tickets and whatever. It was, um, I don't know, it was a little more thoughtful, more sophisticated. Um, and, you know, it was very costumey. It wasn't about taking off your clothes. It was about, it was definitely like, wow, I could experiment with more. I could, um, I didn't necessarily cover my body in glitter, and, you know, and, okay. you know, um, um, I could say more, but. I, mm. <laughs> you have dozens and oh. dozens of Polaroids with different looks, and yes. I know these must be people that you've worked with, but I'm not sure what the context here this is, is for this. So this is the heyday of the Dazzle Dancers. This is 2006, and this is, um, so we, re the Dazzle Dancers, we did a, a music video. Um, Booty de Chef Dazzle, his name, his real name is Bill Coleman, he got the rights to the Love Boat. And so we remade a Love Boat video and you can Google it, Google Dazzle Dancers, The Love Boat. And uh, so we had like this big video release party as part of, like, part of the party was um, a review of all of the Dazzle Dancer looks over the years, um, even the ones that I didn't design. And so um, I had people over to my apartment and I did fittings. And these are some of the looks and these are some of the models. <laughs> so um, you know, there's Kelly Webb, Daryl Thorne, is that Tigger? God, I think that's Tigger. Um, Gemma, she doesn't live here anymore. Marcus, obviously. Um, my gorgeous friend, Dulce de Leche. Um, that's her burlesque name. Uh, so these are all your looks, though? These are all my looks. Mm -hmm. I know from different, and you know, every time we did a, <sighs> the Hazel Dancers, we were all over the place. We had such fun. Uh, this is from a Dolly Parton number that we did. This is from Wigstock. This was from, it wasn't even a number. We just had to like show up at a paper magazine party doing that. That was um, oh, from an Almodovar party. We did, I forget the song that we did. Mm. This was like a weird, it was like one of the weirdest looks. I mean, it's, I mean, anyway. And then, actually that's not one of my looks, sorry. That's one of um, Gary's looks. 
But I liked it, and I helped put it together anyway. Anyway, yeah. Um, this is back to the red, white, and blue motif. There's so right. much material so uh, related to this um, yes. theme, and I just thought you'd like to talk more about that. Sure. So red, white, and blue, I, this, these are the kind of things that I do on the streets at a parade. So this, is, this actually is me from my Glamerican's years. Hmm. Uh, like, so my sign was two-sided. It said, so you're still hungry. The other side said, wet your lips and make love to your country. Um, this is me at the Michael Moore opening on Broadway. <laughs> that's, that's the most recent look. Well, actually, no, that's not the most recent. Oh, actually, oh, no, those two are more recent. Um, so that's my look for that. And then, um, I don't know if any of you were there, but then there was this little parade from the theater to, Tom, uh, not Tompkins Square. Where did they used to have Fashion Week? Bryant Park, thank you. We marched to Bryant Park, and um, we had like a little like drum and fife situation um, with Michael Moore, who was very gracious, and I have a picture with him somewhere. Um, this is my Easter parade look from this year, last year, 2019. It's still this year to me. Um, there's that. Um, this is a look that I created, um, which is not uh, from the street, but I created it for... Um, uh, there's this girl, Natasha Bowden, down at the Moody Arts Center at, at Rice University in Houston, who was interested in my work and invited me to come and participate, collaborate with her. She created this really gorgeous installation at the Moody Arts Center, and she invited musicians, puppeteers, dancers, um, to come and like do something and um, activate the space. I went down and um, it, was, it was very cool. This is one of the looks. Uh, if you really want to know, find me after and I could show you a few things on my phone. But, uh, but then again, I, this, was, this look was pushing it because I wanted something in there. Um, it, um, all of the colors were in place. Um, the models were in the space, but you couldn't really tell that they were there. They were so camouflaged because the installation was such. Um, it was actually very exciting. Um, so, there's a video online somewhere. So, yeah. Sorry, but like, what about the origins of, of using the flag in the red, white, and blue? I, I love, I don't, um, there's something I love about the American flag. Um, I, I, there's something I love about it. Um, I don't know if it's like this like nostalgia. Um, you know, I'm an American who thinks that, you know, I, I, I do believe in America. We have, you know, the power for good. I mean, you know, forget about what might be going on right now. I, I think about, sometimes you just have to think about the good things, <laughs> you know, and even though I tear, I might deconstruct an American flag, but I just have a different kind of patriotism than some people do. Um, I love the red, white, and blue. I love the flag. Um, it, when you use it, you know, you're right there in current events. You're right there in the past, present, and future. It's a constant reminder of what is. Uh, and I think that's why I use it. It's, I think it's a very deep image. Mm. And maybe it couple. seems a little overkill. <laughs> I don't know, some people are probably like sick of it. But I am not, I don't grow sick of it for some reason. Mm. Mm. Here's a couple of other images that you pulled out for oh. me to look at. This one, I, oh I don't God. remember what this was about, but I know this is one of your looks. Oh, Here. right, did you have the other, you know, the other page? <laughs> oh, this is, um, Okay, well, okay, this is, this was like, I, I styled this person. This person is obviously making fun of, <laughs> um, I don't know, this annoying right-wing patriotic person. Um, and I styled, that was like just a, I don't know, it was a, some kind of a zine. Hmm. And um, there I am. And there's um, Cherry Dazzle up in the far corner. Uh, someone just asked me to style it. I was like, okay. It was actually kind of silly, but there it is. Um, top, that's me and Eric Mercer um, marching, I think. Was that Washington? It must have been. Yes, that was in Washington. And then um, that was part of the Glamericans. This was one of my, from one of my Glamericans um, fashion shows back in the day. Um, the thing is, on the other page that you can't see, 
there's a, a military wedding and the woman's dress is made out of the American flag. Here, this is my um, good friend, uh, my late friend Stanley Love, um, who just died last year. Um, he's wearing a shredded vintage American flag in my show in this crowded gay bar. And this uh, Radar was the name of this magazine that, I don't know, it kind of came and went. And, uh, but I didn't even know. <laughs> this. There they were, they got the picture. Um, but it was just, it was very interesting that they juxtaposed those, it's like military wedding, woman. Her wedding dress was the American flag. And then me shredding the American flag at this gay bar in New York. Mm, mm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so you, I want to get to the topic of your relationship um, to a lot of the artists you work with. You, you've told me before, and I think this is a wonderful way to describe your work, that I'm an artist in the role of a costume designer. And so that implies certain things, especially when it comes to collaborating with cabaret artists like Julie Muse or Taylor Mack or Justin Vivian Bond, like, um, because they also have a creative vision that they expect you to carry out. But I know in a lot of your costume work, you're interested in telling your own stories. And so I thought we might want to move to the costumes for the very celebrated and award-winning 24 decade of, of um, popular music. And um, I'm not sure if people are that familiar with it. So what I did was put two costumes per slide. And I think I have three slides. And so um, these run through, this is 1776 to 86, that, that particular portion of the performance. And then this is the 1786 to 96, um, 36 to 46 here, 1836 to 46, and then 1876 to 1886. Um, and then this is 66 to 76. Um, and I think the same, no, this is a little later, the 1980s. So no, this is after, this is, is 96 to 2006. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, but I thought who sent you, you might these? want to just pick out one or two of these costumes and talk to us about the stories that you're trying to tell because right. they do drive the performance in a very interesting way but above and beyond say Taylor Mac's vision even right um, who is familiar with Taylor Mac in here some hands okay. has anyone seen any of the 24 decade show some people okay great um, well I designed the show and um, why don't we just start with the opening number? So Taylor comes to me and he's like, hey, machine, I need, you know, um, I need a 17, I need like an opening, like an American Revolution. I need um, like something from the 1770s. You know, this is back before we had really the show like laid out. And um, so I came up with this thing and I'm like, okay, so I started thinking about things and um, you know, I collect things. I'm, I'm not exactly a hoarder. I just see the value in things because I make things out of things. I don't have a reason to not collect things. Um, and it actually all started when I was walking in Brooklyn one day and I, uh, there was this laundromat who had had a grand opening a very long time ago. <laughs> and you know how they put those flags outside. Um, and they were taking down the old flags and putting up new ones <laughs> of a, you know, a 20 year grand opening. Anyway, so I was like, and I just loved the state of the flags because they'd been out in the weather for years. They were like torn and faded and brittle and weird looking and I'm like, wow, I mean, you can't really fake that or it'd be hard to fake that. And if you did fake it, then you know that you faked it. It's not authentic. And I like authentic. So I'm like, can I have those? And I'm, they're like, yeah, totally. I'm like, okay, great. So I took them. And then there's more in the garbage can over there. I'm like, great. So I pulled them out. And um, I'm like, wow, I like grand opening. Grand opening of America. Like American Revolution. That's what I called it. And I started to formulate the story. Whenever I make a costume, uh, particularly for Taylor Mac, it always has a story. And the story for the, this is the opening costume. The story for this is, <clears throat> Betsy Ross has an illegitimate queer child who ran away from home to New Orleans and uh, opened up a laundromat called La Washerie. And she just happens to be the unofficial cheerleader of the original 13 colonies. <laughs> 
that's the story of this costume. And so, as down here, you have like the panniers. Those are the flags down there. Um, I made this little top, you know, 13, kind of like sporty. She's a cheerleader, but she's sporty, so but 13, 13 colonies. The backpack thing is just like, you know, oh my God, 4th of July, you know, the fireworks. Um, you know, the, the macaron, the outrageous hair of the day, I'm obsessed, love. And that's, that's, those are the other um, things that the laundromat was taking down, that's what made the hair. And then, um, I don't know, there's some gloves in there too. Like, so that's kind of how I make things. There's a story, and of course it, it doesn't make sense, but it kind of does at the same time, you know? Um, so I'm just creating my own uh, dialogue. So here, um, I don't know which one's easier to talk about. This one is really, there's less of a story in here. We took the, the Mikado, and um, there's no really correct way for, you know, a white person to perform the Mikado, a white cast. So instead of setting it anywhere on Earth, we set it on Mars. And we performed, the, that was one of the decades of the show. And so this is really just more about, but all of the lines are actually still very Japanese. Um, because somehow a lot of like space design is, has a taste of Asia in it. I don't know if you ever noticed that. I've noticed it. I don't know. Anyway, so there's that. This one is um, songs popular during the Underground Railroad. And this is, you know, this is another area where I, you know, uh, as a, you know, I'm sorry, I keep touching it. Uh, you know, a Caucasian artist, I, you know, it's, you know, Underground Railroad is really not my story. But here we are singing, you know, um, uh, Underground Railroad songs and abolitionist songs also. But what do you wear for something like that? So I decided to be poetic about it. And um, uh, he has already discarded it, but he comes out wearing this big, see that big green thing? It's actually a river with grass and rocks, you know, and like follow the river, you know. It becomes about time and place, and uh, the dress is um, a monarch butterfly pattern underneath this clear crystal, you know, sequin thing. So the emerging, uh, the emerging butterfly, it becomes more about like migration. Um, and uh, the time of the clock, I mean, about, anyway. This is a radical lesbian decade. Just look at it. I don't think it needs explanation to you. And this is <laughs> um, just this is stuff everywhere. Are those butterfly wings? So 1996 to 2006. This is making, I feel like it's just noisy. Okay. Um, finally, well, in the whole 24 hour show, we kept trying to find the place for the radical lesbian. I feel like in all of this time, she'd finally, she had just like always, like there was never a space. There was never a space. It's a man's world, it's a man's world. And if there's finally women, it's like, well, it doesn't include lesbians. You know, finally, we're making space for the lesbians in this decade. Um, but you know, you know, 96, 2006, I, there are elements of grunge. Um, during that time, the very first um, uh, Victoria's Secret angel show happened. That's where those angel fashion shows come from. So I, I made wings and I made them look like labia. Mm. And they lit up and there's clitorises there too. And um, you know, like the really radical lesbians who go topless and write on their bodies, you know, um, I'm, oh, I love it so much. And so I made them this nude bodysuit with all of these things all over it. Those are actually fake, very expensive breasts. <laughs> Um, got online, they're from far away. They look real, but I wanted it. I wanted it to be, even though Taylor is not a woman. I wanted it to be woman. I wanted to, like make the space for it. Mm. Um, I wanted it to be beautiful mm. um, somehow. And I thought that you know, like the breasts, the natural-looking breasts, even though maybe they don't look that natural, it softens the look. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So oh. we'll finish up here because I know the audience wants to ask questions, but um, this is an image from your recent performance at the Guggenheim Treasures. Yes. And I understand you're here now because you're working on a companion piece. What are you doing um, now? Where's your, what's, what's the future? What's in store for the future for you? So I did this show at the Guggenheim uh, 
Uh, thank you for the commission. Works in process. I'm very happy about it. Um, it's called Treasure. And Treasure is a group of songs that are about my mother, my relationship to my mother, and my reaction to my relationship with my mother. Uh, and so I did kind of a kind of like a rock and roll show in a cabaret format. And this was just this past September. We happened, our, my show, all three of them happened during fashion week, so I decided, well, I have to have a fashion show in there. That's how people know me. And I did want a strong visual element to the show, because I'm not enough. And uh, so I sent out 12 models. They're all friends of mine during one of the songs. And uh, because I thought it would be very imbalanced to only do a show about my mother, so I'm working on a show about my father. Now, the show about my mother is called uh, treasure. The song um, about, or the show about my father is called The Painting. And um, it's, it's definitely a lot more political. And uh, um, I feel like there was a lot of nurturing in treasure. And uh, my father, even though he wasn't completely absent, he really wasn't at home a lot. Uh, you know, I grew up with him just being gone all the time. He worked on oil tankers. Um, for you know months at a time, and then he would come home, and he would have a, like a beard. You know, it's like he always seemed like a little strange. He was always he always looked different. You know, when he came back from when he left, and uh, our relationship has just always been a little bit different. I don't think I'm. He always when I was younger, he tried to push me into sports. Um, he he wanted me to be somebody else, and it took him a while, um, but he did. He came around. Uh, you know. Right after my mother passed, he admitted something to me. He's like, you know, Matthew, I knew you were gay since you were two years old. Mm. That's what he, he told me. I was like, wow. Anyway, um, it's not all bad with my father, but it's um, uh, because of like, you know, like oil. And then uh, he was uh, um, laid off in the 80s during this oil crisis. There was too much oil. There was a merger between Chevron and Gulf Oil. He worked for Gulf. And so all of these thousands of people laid off, and he was one of them. And, um, and then he found a job at a nuclear power plant in Idaho. Uh, and so that was a little culture shock. And so I just, you know, I think about oil and fossil fuels, and I think about nuclear power. But I think about this um, man who was just struggling to keep his family alive. And I have to see it both ways. And so, you know, that's, that's what's at play in the painting. Okay. A lot of it. Yeah. Oh, wish you luck on that. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we have time for questions from the audience. And uh, Ellie, I believe you have the microphone that you want to pass around so everyone's on tape. I do. Does okay. anyone have any questions for Machine Dazzle? Don't be scared. Looks like I covered it. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Hi. How do you choose your music and what instrumentation do you like? I I've never really asked other people how they make music. So I don't which is good for answering your question because I I um I can only um tell you how I make music. Um I usually have a thought. Um, I'm really good at creating melodies in my head. And um, I um, am constantly recording my voice without, they don't have, I don't have words necessarily yet, like into my phone. I create melodies. And then later I create poems or stories. And without fail, always, um, there's, there's something that I've written in words that just matches, you know, these melodies that I'm feeling. And um, I guess any kind of instrumentation could work, but I really just love rock and roll. I love synth. I love electric sounds. Um, I don't like folky. I don't really, I really appreciate the acoustic guitar, but I don't like the sound. It's too folky to me. Um, I like the electric guitar. I love drums. I love lots of harmonies. Um, in my 
mind, I always have like a choir behind me because I love that. I love getting people involved. Music makes me want to sing. And um, strangely enough, um, when I hear music, that's when I really make art, visual art. There's nothing visual that inspires me as much as music. Give me like a song that I love, and I could do like a whole show to it. That's how much I'm affected by music. I just see shapes. This is what I want to wear while I'm dancing to this song. You know, things like that. Um, and, you know, yeah. Did I answer your question? I did. This is, you're going to see how I, did I answer all of your questions? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, can you tell me what song you were singing in that particular shot there? So this, um, first of all, this is a shot not actually on the Guggenheim stage. This was leading up to the Guggenheim. Uh, we were at, um, oh my god. <laughs> Where was I? I was, um, thank you, I was up at Lumberyard. <laughs> thank you, in um, Catskill. And uh, this is where we did our real uh, rehearsal uh, for the Guggenheim, and it's the only time that we put this material in front of an audience before we went to the Guggenheim. And, I'm going to say because of the lighting, well, I don't know. I think this might have been like right before Welcome to My Sex Life. Welcome to My Sex Life is a song. Um, I just know because of like, just like the red lighting. I think it is. I think so. Well, you have time off here, so time off, Welcome to My Sex Life? Oh, well, because I, I introduce, Mom is always in my mind throughout the whole show, because the show is about my, my mother, um, that uh, I designed and had that neon sign made that was actually a sketch. I decided, well, this is, it's a very simple set. I want the message to be simple. Um, I'm talking, I'm channeling her. I'm talking to her during this show, and I know that she's present. I know that she's here. Um, so, you know, there's a huge, there's a wall of cardboard boxes in the back, and then there's like this hi mom sign. Um, welcome to my sex life. Uh, that's, uh, that's after I, it happens at a very interesting time in the show. What happened is this, I, uh, I was upstate somewhere with my boyfriend at the time, this is 1996, and um, I knew that my mother wasn't doing very well. I got home, and there was a message on the answering machine, 90s, um, from my father. And he told me to call him, and of course, um, I didn't have to, I already knew. Mother had gone, and um, actually, wait, no, I'm ahead of myself. I'm sorry. I'm telling the wrong story. This is an even better story. <laughs> actually, not that much better. It's actually kind of sad, but it's very honest. I moved to New York in 1994, it was August, literally one month after I moved to New York, my mother called me and told me she was diagnosed with cancer, and, but I was, I was 20 years old, I just moved to New York, I couldn't, I was just figuring things out, and I didn't, I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to go, but I just, a month ago, I'm not, I'm not going back home. I just started making my own decisions for myself. I grew up, they were, I was very sheltered. I could never, it was always no. It was never yes. Um, they knew I was gay from an early age. Do you think they nurtured it at all? No. Nurturing of any of the arts? No. That's not what they wanted. They wanted somebody else. I moved to New York. I bought a one-way ticket. I'd never been to New York before I moved there. I got off the plane. Boom. I wasn't going back, not even the news. Um, and so when you hear the song, it's just kind of like this empowering, um, uh, it's my life now, my decisions, my choices. Welcome, welcome to my sex life. Mm, yeah, yeah. And that's actually the song that the uh, models come out to. <laughs> I go and I have a quick change. 
Mm. Now, who, de who designed your jeans? Uh, I'm sorry? Who designed, your, who designed your jeans? These? Um, you know what? They're not authentic camouflage. I don't know. I, I buy a lot of my clothes at a secondhand store. Um, I don't know who designed them, but they're, I don't know, they might be Levi's or something. But I definitely got them at a secondhand store. And they're not um, jeans, they're like fatigues. They're like, I mean, like, you know. You know. <laughs> we can look after the show. Someone wants to, <laughs> maybe my tag is sticking out. <laughs> Um, are there, is there one artist or a few or artists or costume designers who have, who you would say have had the biggest influence on you and your work? I think, you know, I'm influenced by everything that I see, hear, taste, experience. Um, Hmm. When, I, when I first started noticing fashion, how's this? Um, I think the biggest influences are from when, and I think my music is too, um, you know, I was born in 1972, but I really didn't start hearing things and probably until I was like eight, like 1980, um, 79, 80, um, which is kind of a weird time. I feel like it's a time that I didn't really know what it was. It was after disco. It's before New Wave. Um, it's kind of like, it's just like a weird time. Um, I remember Halston. And I remember how simple and glamorous it was. I do remember Halston. And the colors, the simplicity, the draping, the elegance. I just saw the documentary on him. Has anyone else seen it? It's kind of good. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize, I didn't know it's what a scandal he was, mm -hmm. if I'm allowed to say that. Sorry, I said it. But, it, but I, I, didn't, I didn't actually, I didn't realize um, like how, like how troubled he was, although I shouldn't be surprised. Um, I liked Halston, and I have this very, I remember when I was really little, and there were certain girls in the school that started dressing like Madonna which like in you know that almost like weird urban gothy way like the lace the rags in the hair uh, the blondes um the the gloves there were girls who were like really doing it and i was in awe of them i was this is before i was um aware of my own body i wouldn't i wasn't always aware of myself um like fashion in my household, you know, we went shopping and me and my brothers went to one section of the store. This is where we got our clothes and that was the end of it. I wasn't allowed to have what I really wanted, you know, especially like, you know, by the time we were in like middle school and I saw like, wow, people are taking ownership of themselves. Um, and their, their parents were letting them do it and I wasn't. Um, I got called fag by my mother a few times. You look like a fag whenever I tried to do something. And so I couldn't, you know, just, you know. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm a maximalist today, because I wasn't allowed to do things when I was growing up. But those ideas, they weren't going anywhere. They stayed inside of me. So I have this reserve. And now, you know, I have a really big reserve. And when I use a little bit of it, I fill it up with as fast as I use it, you know? Maybe. It's a theory. <laughs> Halston, Madonna. <laughs> Influence. I'm sorry, but where did you grow up? Um, my, I was born um, just outside of Philadelphia, but I was less than a year old when I moved. Um, because my father, it was easier for him to commute to work from Houston to Corpus Christi because of the oil thing. Um, we lived in a suburb, I grew up in uh, two suburbs just north of Houston. One is called New Caney, the other one is called Kingwood. And then in 1983, four, that's when the oil crisis happened. My father lost his job and 
we moved uh, from this, you know, um, upper middle class suburb of Houston to Idaho Falls, which is still a city of about 80,000 people and 99% Mormon. Um, it's in southeast Idaho. It's desert. It's no, it's not the beautiful, it's not Coeur d'Alene or Sun Valley or any of those beautiful, it's, it's dry, it's very clean. It's dry, there's not a lot going on. And then um, my older brother graduated from high school and he uh, uh, started going to uh, Colorado School of Mines in Golden. And so mom and dad thought to be closer to um, my brother, we decided to move to Colorado. Um, so my first, uh, my one week into my senior year of high school, we moved actually to Colorado, just north of Colorado, um, Westminster, another suburb, uh, north of Denver. Uh, and so I finished high school in Colorado in Westminster. It was a brand new high school that looked kind of like a shopping mall. I was the first graduating class <laughs> so first class to graduate from it. And, um, and yeah, and then I went to CU, but not before, I didn't want to go to University of Colorado in Boulder. I wanted to go to an art school, um, but I couldn't because we didn't have the money. I applied to like three art schools, um, RISD, Parsons, and Cooper Union. Of course, I didn't get into Cooper Union. I got accepted at RISD and at um, Parsons, but I couldn't afford it. Um, there's no amount of financial aid, even after... Uh, Whatever. So I uh, and I didn't. I was so going to will it. I wanted it to happen so much. I didn't have a backup at any school that I could get into. So I spent the year working at McDonald's after high school. The McDonald's is right across the street from the high school because I graduated from. And then the next year I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder. And then in 1994 I moved to New York. Both of my parents are from a really small town in Maine, too. And I, I, even though I never lived there, um, we would visit a few summers in my lifetime. And, uh, but it's important that I say that because, um, you know, they were both born in the 40s in a very small town along Route 1. If anyone knows Maine, Route 1, like on your way to... My mother was born in Eastport, and my father was born in Calais. And the town they grew up in is really just a bunch of houses. It's called Pembroke, really small. And so it was, um, then they had the Maine accent. So, you know, going home, small town mentality. And then I go to school in Texas and we are fixing to have a pop quiz, y'all. I hope you're ready. You know, and so I kind of, my, my accent, I don't have a southern accent or, I don't really know. I think it's kind of a weird mix of stuff. Mm. Sorry, I ramble. I have a question. <laughs> Any chance of a Dazzle Dancers reunion show? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because, because of Alyssa here, um, there is renewed interest. Um, uh, we've been chatting about how this exhibit is going to happen and how it'll be, you know, structured and organized um, in, you know, the galleries there and. I, I have to have, you know, a section of the Dazzle Dancers. And um, so I've started reaching out to s select Dazzle Dancers um, uh, for different reasons. Um, uh, okay, photographs, memorabilia, who still has anything? Um, uh, like, you know, press, you know, whatever. And um, there's talk of, every, all of the Dazzle Dancers will be there for like opening night, let's say, or closing night. I don't know what's better, opening or closing. I like both. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll do a Dazzle Dance because we're not allowed to have like glitter in the, but if we do, we can do a glitterless Dazzle Dance. Well, you see, you're not really naked if your body is covered in glitter. And when I say your body is covered in glitter, like I really mean it. Like we would take like Vaseline intensive care lotion and then like pour glitter into it and like do this and like literally like rub our entire bodies. If you Google Dazzle Dancer, you'll see some things. 
I'm not responsible for what you see. There are some questionable photographs out there of my person. I'm we'll not. We'll them somehow. We will. Yeah, we will. We will. But there's we glitter will. on it, whatever you find. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're all going to be Googling tonight. Well, thank you so much, Machine and Lisa. This is an amazing event. Thank you so much.